Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and joining me in the studio today are three of our panelists ready to tackle your gardening questions. So we'll start down here with John. Have everybody introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about your specialty. Okay, I'm John Bowden Center. I'm a Vermilion County uh, Master Gardener. Uh, I enjoy shade plants because I planted too many trees in my younger years. And so I don't have a lot of sunny areas, so I do enjoy hostas. I have uh, a little over 300 varieties of hostas and um, a lot of other shade plants. And I'm starting to get a little bit more into sunny areas. Uh, I've got, a, I'm developing a sunny area, cutting down a few of the old, old trees that are past their prime. So mm -hmm. I'm getting, getting into, so I like anything that's green is usually one of my favorites. I saw a hosta at a nursery and it made me think of you. It was a new, I don't know if it was a newer variety, but new to me, uh, very skinny kind oh. of. Uh, Hands up. I don't know, but it Jigsaw. just it looked very tropical. Yes, and I thought, <laughs> I wonder if John has this out at his house. Yep, I got Jigsaw. I figured, okay. <laughs> Go ahead and introduce yourself. And in my opinion, hosta make great slug food. <laughs> Other than that. Nah. But I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an entomologist, retired from the University of Illinois. And so I get into insects and, and also live out on three and a half acres where we have where we do some aquatic gardening and some uh, bonsai. And bonsai and vegetable gardening and planted somewhere around 500 trees in that three and a half acres. So wow. well, I still have a lot of sunny areas so, because I bush my trees. Oh. Any rate, I'm glad to answer bug questions. Excellent, okay. Uh, I'm Ella Maxwell. I'm a Tazewell County Master Gardener as well as a horticulturist um, at a local, local garden center and I'm working part-time now. And uh, I enjoy trees, shrubs, uh, perennials, and uh, have a large garden or a large landscape, large yard, um, and uh, have tried all kinds of things. And I love learning new things. And every single uh, show, I learn something new, as well as some of the Zoom presentations that uh, I've had opportunity to see. So, you can uh, always be learning something. That's right. That's right. With regard to this. Okay, we got show and tells the first round. Uh, why don't we start with you? What'd you bring? Okay, well, I've got a little bag here. Uh, we can see, and inside, uh, I had an old African violet. Mm. It had variegated foliage, and it had, it was beautiful, but it had multiple crowns, oh. and um, I decided that I wanted to propagate it. And so African violets are propagated by leaf cuttings. And so I used um, this small veg or um, meat, you know. Lunch meat. Lunch meat uh -huh. tray here. I poked some holes for drainage right along either side. I used this as the saucer. I used this seed starting mix. And um, I used some, um, rooting hormone that I uh, just dipped the ends of my leaves in and the soil was moist and I added a little extra water and they have been sitting in here for months. I was just gonna ask how long they've been it, in there. It They're, takes a long time, but healthy. you can, you can oh, let's yeah. see, how can we see? There, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but there's a little tiny plant starting. And so I, it's about time now for me to take these out and repot them. Um, I believe I can just, uh, I'm gonna just leave the leaf on, but cut it back by mm -hmm. two thirds. And I'm going to just start these little plants again. And it's an easy way to propagate uh, violets. Now, when you're talking about taking this piece off, is that so that the plant can concentrate on the newer growth? Well, yeah, and also it'll give more light penetration Got down it. to the base here because it's right at the base where these little um, new uh, plants' eyes start from, and that's where they'll become the crown of the plant. But it was really attractive and... Mm -hmm. uh, um, Beautiful foliage. You can, you can divide the, the mother plant, but you can also start them very easily from mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. leaf cuttings. But it just it. takes a long time. It takes a long. It takes a long time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you. All right, Phil. We're going to go to you. Before we get off of African violets, I have to yes. give a, a plug. Okay. And that is that uh, many local areas have their own little African violet clubs or societies, and uh, you can find those from the 
uh, African Violets of America. There's oh. a website that will have Are you on the information club? on that. Oh. And our local no. club here in the Champaign-Urbana area where the University of Illinois is located is called the Margaret Scott African Violet Club of which my wife is very active in. So ah. that's why if I get mm -hmm. home, I will get. <laughs> oh, yeah. Home. So she you would have, could been. have done a plug. You, yeah, you missed that opportunity. Yeah, missed plug. <laughs> any rate, <laughs> when you're putting out tomatoes, and uh, we're actually, uh, typically, uh, latter half of May is, in my opinion, the, the ideal time to plant tomatoes. Uh, it's uh, many times thought that uh, there's a little joke that goes around in the trade, and that is that garden centers make money but by selling the same people tomatoes three, Twice. four, and five times, <laughs> yeah. because they start them out too early, mm -hmm. and and they get and, and they get frozen off, or even worse, when they get frozen off, you know they're dead. When they get stunted, you don't realize it. But nighttime cold temperatures down into certainly the 30s, and I think even around 40 or 41 is enough to cause the the tomato to stop growing for a couple free weeks and just mm -hmm. sit there. Mm. And so all of a sudden they realize that, hey, my tomato leaves started kind of turning purple and it's not growing. Uh, that garden center must have gave me some lousy plants, which of course it wasn't. It was the lousy person put them in the garden too early. <laughs> but the point is, is that you get to sell them over and over and over again until they finally get some. Uh, but at any rate, a, a real problem that we have with, with uh, tomatoes are our transplants when they're put out are cutworms, and and I have a cutworm model uh, created at no lack of expense. <laughs> uh, it's essentially uh, a tomato tie, is what it is. Okay. And I cut a little piece off. It's an inch and a half long, which is the size of a full-grown black cutworm. And these guys come are night active. They work for night shift. And they will come out after dusk and crawl across the surface of the, of the soil. And when they come to a tomato plant, they love tomatoes. They will do it to others, but mainly tomatoes. What will happen is that the, is that the, is that the caterpillar around. will curl its body around the plant and eat, off, eat it off. And you end up with... Uh, sometimes they'll crawl all the way to the top and you start losing foliage from the top down. Sometimes they just cut it off here in the center and towards the bottom and you end up with a one half to one inch long tomato stem that's left. And you know, if the tomato is too big, they only eat part of the tomato leaves and leave the rest of it to wilt and die, which is sometimes even more frustrating than taking it all. Ways that you can, there are several ways that you can stop this. One is you can use insecticides around it. But what I tend to use and what I find work, works best is anything that forms a collar around that plant will protect it. And what I like to use is old coffee cans, but you can't buy coffee cans in the, anymore. They're all Plastic. coffee plastics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but at any rate, uh, cut out both ends. And uh, this happens to be a, a, um, a high uh, a warehouse bean container, actually. So it's the same size. And, uh, and essentially, just put them down over the tomato, stick them, shove it into the soil about an inch. Mm -hmm. The black cutworm will tunnel into the soil, but normally not more than an inch. And it will crawl to go over something, but usually not more than about an inch to an inch and a half. So it's not going to work so all real you hard. Need is some sort of, yeah, it's not going to work real hard. <laughs> Comes up to this, it's doodling along. He's straight at this point. Comes doodling along, hits this and goes, oh, I need to go around and go on to the next tomato plant. That's a lot of work. And that works real well. So these things work fabulous. Mm -hmm. And really anything you want to put around that tomato will do the job. Um, I saw one that a lot of people will use, will cut out the bottoms of... Um, of five gallon buckets, plastic five gallon buckets mm -hmm. and do that. Another way to do is you make the stem too large for this caterpillar to coil around. I Meaning do a little one like that, but if you come in and you put a nail right next to the stem like this, all of a sudden you have too big of a stem for the, for the worm to, co to, to coil around. He has to coil around in order to eat it off. That gives him his He's, you've got to have some, some anchorage mm -hmm. in order to chew. And so, again, you'll say this one's too big and you'll go on to the next one. So just a good-sized nail next to your tomato stem will also do the job. But I've always done, hey, and, and one peppers, thing I've always liked peppers. to tell people before, is to control pests 
you have to have more intelligence than the past. <laughs> and that can be a challenge to some people. I was going to say, but, that's, you know, well, and, and that is really great advice because I, a lot of people just discount some type of physical barrier. I think we have a question about transplants yes. um, up here you and, they, and wanna, they wanna protect it and it's rabbit damage. And there are all kinds of insecticides or scent deterrents for larger, mm -hmm. larger um, voles and mm -hmm. mice and rabbits and deer, but a physical barrier is probably the easiest thing to do. My entire vegetable garden has been surrounded for the last 15 years by the same three foot high close mess fence. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I've exactly. Never had a, uh -huh. Once I got a rabbit tunneling under it, but we took care of that with with some soil and a concrete block, but other How than that, that? You know? right, right, and that, and that's what I have around my garden too. Is is a, a, re, a larger fence, and the little baby rabbit got in. But if you use chicken wire, mm -hmm. we so you know we just zip tied a little short piece here, and it and it folds down mm -hmm. so they can't really dig under. But the physical barrier is is the way to go for the transplanting the offshoot to protect it. And Let's go ahead and read that yeah. one. This is from uh, Larry Adams. It's a Facebook question that came in. Um, <clears throat> when can you transplant a rose bush that is an offshoot from the original rose bush? The bush died. Is there anything that you can do uh, to keep rabbits from eating the green tops of those plants? So Right. That, that was the whole idea, is that the physical barrier is the easiest once it gets going, they probably won't be as attractive to mm -hmm. the uh, adult rabbit. It's usually early in the spring, it's the small baby rabbits that are problematic. They haven't learned what's good to eat or not good to eat. They're just biting everything. And I have a, I have a little rose bush in my, in my yard that right now has an old bird cage sitting over the top of it. Yeah. The bottom was oh. open, oh, yeah. just yeah. set it over the top oh. of it. And it's been there since last fall. Protected the protected the rose bush through the entire winter mm -hmm. into spring, mm -hmm. and uh, you know right. that's a really good and idea. Yeah. I fun. use um, uh, wire hanging baskets. I turn them up, turn them upside down, mm -hmm. and then I put those over coral bells because I have a problem with the rabbits during the winter eating the coral bells down mm. um, the crown of the plant, and so they just stay that's on year idea. round. The leaves come out; it hides it. Wow. You know, um, and someone said, oh, you can use um, antique egg baskets. And I said, well, where do you get antique egg baskets? And, and how they much go, do you have to pay? Yeah, exactly. that's what I said too. I'm going to try to find something in the garage. We have another question, <laughs> we have another question about a blackberry bush. Yes, too. we can do that one too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, this I is think from it's the same thing. Elise uh, Ramirez. This is an email question, kind of long, so bear with. Uh, thanks for the program. We learned so much from the show and your guests. You have a special way of keeping us engaged including some photos of our thornless blackberries at Jubilee Farm, located in Jacksonville, uh, near Springfield. Can you help us identify what is happening to the canes? Over the last few years, I haven't seen them like this. I did a check on a number of websites. Um, so they're really trying to figure out what is going on. They don't know if it's deer or squirrel, um, and you guys have had a chance to see the picture. So what are your thoughts on that? We're, we're sure it was, if it's that close to the ground, we're sure it was a rabbit. Could have been a squirrel, but we're, Pretty much sure that it right. was a rabbit. Right, and, and again, if your blackberry bushes, you know, maybe you haven't thought about having some kind of fencing around it to, and it was probably during the winter. Right, mm. it was, I'm sure it was during the winter when there, that, that cambium layer at, in the wintertime when there's not too much else green is very nutritious. And, mm. you know, so they're going to go after that where the sugars and starches are, are, are and all that, that cambium layer is, is, like I say, is highly nutritious. That's what they're going to eat. And they're gonna. So and then you, gonna, if they if they go all the way around the the trunk, uh, if it's an apple tree, then your apple tree is dead or you're girdled. Yeah, girdled. Well, you it's cut off that? completely. Uh, the uh, rabbits, which and and also their close relatives, rodents, are going to have large front teeth, and when they cut off something, it'll look like you took a pair of pruners and snipped it right off. It's mm -hmm. going to be a clean cut, usually a little bit of an at angle. At an angle, yeah. I usually can usually tell angle. it's at an angle. Whereas mm -hmm. she was concerned about deer. Deer have, I don't think they have any teeth in the front of their, of their skull. So what they do is they grab a hold and jerk. They're called browsers. They'll tend to go after more woody things. But you have a, you have a very ragged type of end of, of a shoot, typically extremely ragged. It's Got usually it. very easy to tell. Uh, deer browse from uh, from rabbit or, or squirrel feeding. 
Got it. Got it. Great information. So physical barriers. Find some mm -hmm. junk in the garage or in the yard and, and use that. There you go. <laughs> Get a bird cage. Um, uh, John, we haven't yes. done your show until yet. No, I, I brought two things here. Uh, this is a, a jelly that I made. I was reading on the internet and I, and I always like to Yeah, this is forage. your thing. You like to make syrups and dips forage. and... And I'm, the next thing is I'm going to make is some dandelion jelly because I hear that it tastes like honey. Ooh. So this, this, I was asking everyone if they could guess what this was. It's got a beautiful color and this is red bud tree jelly. Oh. I know most of the red buds are done blooming right now. But if you ever get a bunch of red buds, and I, I think I used um, three cups of flowers to make a, a batch of, of uh Have of, you had uh, this before? Gel. No. No. And uh, it really is very pretty and it is. nice color, and it has a floral citrusy taste. Bill so guessed rhubarb, which was a super, well, that, that yeah, was a good and guess. And that, if you had red rhubarb, this, that would be the color uh -huh, that you would have. Uh-huh. And, but... Anyway, I just thought I'd share that. It was something I, I enjoy I doing. always love when you I, share. I'm writing that down. <laughs> the, the other thing I brought was a cana bulb. And this is what, cana, if anybody is not familiar, they are uh, stately. This is a small one, yet they'll get to be, what, eight foot tall mm -hmm. easily. But this is, this is what I stored last, last winter. And uh, this is a little bit bigger than what I'd want to plant. So what I would do is I would... When I was ready to plant it, I would start to just pull it apart and you could take a knife and if you're, you know, and cut it apart. And what I usually would do is do this about a day before I'm going to, um, before I'm going to plant it. So it has a tend, tend uh, to, to uh, callus off. What mm -hmm. they, and, and I could even break this one because there's a couple more nodes here. And so break that off. Uh, this is, break that off. And here's another one. Mm -hmm. And you can see I've already got five, five, and this was just part of a root. So you could end up with, you know, I've got, I think, <laughs> six garbage cans full of Oh my of, gosh. Of cana bulbs. Six and that's, garbage that's cans. That's where they need to stay. <laughs> no. Holy and cow. How many you're not neighbors a can? do you have that run when you come with can no, can you know I love them. So <laughs> I, I I do I do you know, we, we have our master gardener sale and uh -huh. I take a lot of them there. Holy but cow. we plant a lot in a meditation garden. We use them as a fence in the mm -hmm. meditation of Schlarman. And so a lot of them go there. But um, Do you grow yours in the ground or do you do containers? I grow them in the ground. In the ground? And I do some in containers also at home. Yeah. But if you don't want to be, and you have to dig these up in the fall. Yes. Now, you don't have to. Because I'm sure your neighbor's digging Karen, his up. Don't watch this show, Karen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you don't have to dig up because your neighbor has probably got six garbage cans full down in the basement. You can treat them as annuals. Right. Oh, and just okay. let them. Yeah, leave some in. I plant some and I harvest some, but I let a lot of them just freeze out yeah. and mm -hmm. compost. Okay. And 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 it's okay because it's okay. There's some plants that. You know, like you know, all your 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 spring uh, flowering bulbs that are full fl fl flowering bulbs that if you don't dig up die, your gladiolas, your mm -hmm. you know your dahlias. Dahlias, yeah. You know, people say, well, I'm not planting those because I don't want to. Don't dig them up. Just treat them as annuals. Yeah. Go buy some new ones in the spring. There you go. They're, right, and buying new ones in the spring is is um, really uh, great now because there is a new canna variety it's called canova cannas um, and these are much shorter oh, yeah. they're less than maybe only half the size three foot mm. uh, they have some beautiful colors they flower very um, vigorously and um, they're those are the ones karen really likes yeah. these new canovas now the one thing to know about the one that john brought in that dark leafed one it is the dark leaf ones are more attractive to Japanese beetles, yeah. wouldn't you say? Okay. Now, do you treat yours? I haven't noticed no. a difference. Really? No. You just let nature I just do let, its thing? You know, usually it's the bottom leaves because they, they keep growing after the Japanese beetles are only here for, what, four to six weeks. The new leaves come up and, and then the, the, old, the new leaves cover up the old ones and you don't notice. Or you can cut them off. If they get too unsightly after the Japanese beetles are done, I just cut them off and, and the new leaves and just let it go from yeah. there. Before we go into uh, another question, I have a question. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys, <clears throat> oh my gosh, I just forgot it. 
Well, we'll have well, a... We'll come back to it when I remember it. <laughs> I, it just escaped me. Okay, we've got another one. This is from Grace Grubb in Kane County. Uh, this is an email about a Meyer lemon tree, another long one. Uh, I bought a 10-inch Meyer lemon tree in a plastic pot. It had three, four-inch green lemon and blossoms on it. Um, they put where the plant is at. It's in a south-facing window. And then she goes on to talk about how the leaves were starting to turn colors. They, um, about a month or so ago, the tree was ready to harvest, but the leaves were less green between the veins, wondering if it's a pH issue, um, tested for moisture. So really struggling with this, with this lemon tree. So what are your thoughts here about um, her successes or Right. Um, again, I think the most important thing is when you're having issues um, is the quality of your soil, but more importantly, what are the roots doing in that soil? And so this is where I think she should take the time to unpot <laughs> the, um, the tree to examine the roots and more than likely overwatering and underwatering played a part. And when the root system is reduced, it's less likely to take up nitrogen, um, and that's where she sees that chlorosis that she was concerned about mm -hmm. with the pH and then she was trying fertilizer. And all of those things are helpful, but the most limiting factor is the fact that maybe the root system is poor and also the amount of light. No, normally uh, citrus uh, would appreciate going outside for the summer and then maybe coming back inside. I think it would be difficult to grow a citrus in even a south facing window year round yeah, without yeah. maybe more supplemental light. Yeah. And um, maybe there's something else going on. You had a suggestion there, Phil? Well, it, she indicated that the, uh, that the leaves started turning, turning yellowish mm -hmm. and lighter colored and then turned brown. And, uh, and even the, the, uh, the veins staying somewhat greenish are all evidences that it could have been Two spotted spider mite attack or citrus mm -hmm. mite in the case of a citrus tree, uh, in which typically they will feed on the underside of the leaves. Typically, spider mites are going to be too small for you to see or barely see with your naked eye. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I always like to say you can put 50 on the head of a straight pin and they have plenty of space to run around. Uh, so they are very tiny, but typically what will happen is leaves that are attacked with spider mites will tend to look dirty on the underside. And this is due to the mites themselves, mm -hmm. their fecal matter, and their cast skins as they grow up, because they grow up very quickly over the span of a couple of weeks through, through three, three molts. So, mm -hmm. so they, will, uh, they will grow up and leave all of this dirty looking material. Uh, the humidity that she was adding from the pebble tray would, uh, would help reduce that because spider mites don't do well under humid situations. However, citrus mites do quite well under humid situations. <laughs> Two spotted spider mites need dry conditions to do well. So whatever she does, she could get a mite that would attack the tree. Uh, normally you would control these uh, if you have a mites and you can use a hand lens to, uh, to look at it, a magnifying glass, and determine, see the little eight-legged uh, mites mm -hmm. associated with that. Uh, insecticidal soap works well, sprayed okay. on, the, on the foliage, and buy insecticidal soap. Do not go online and look for Make a whole own remedy recipe. of your own <laughs> soap, because the soaps that you have in your counter are going to be used for, uh, for uh, getting, the, getting uh, grease off of dishes and grime right. off of clothes, and they have things that will take the waxy coverings off the leaves but the insecticidal soaps are soaps just like those other soaps, but they've been selected for ones that don't do that. Mm -hmm. They will, all the soaps will kill the mites, but insecticidal soaps are not as likely to kill the plant. Thank you, sir. Uh, John, we've got time for one more show and tell if you <coughs> want. And while you're grabbing that, I remembered my question. Can I please get rid of the unsightly tulip foliage in my bed now? No. No. I knew Sorry. you guys were gonna say that. No, until it's brown. It's cramping my style. If you don't, if, you know, <laughs> if you don't mind not having tulips next year. No, I want them. Right, and, and lots of. That's it's why. It's just so ugly That right is now. exactly why in a 
formal garden settings, if you're going to botanical gardens or everything, they're replanting every single year. They dig those they up, dig they're up, throwing yeah. them away, and it's like, oh, I want, the, oh, I want to Please take. Please don't. Yeah, <laughs> but um, there are different kinds of tulips, and the best thing to do is just put some annuals by those tulips now, right next to them, and let them kind just of. Just kind of grow up. Yeah, okay. cover it fine, up. Fine, fine, fine. Okay. All right, we've got about a minute and 30 okay. left, John. Uh, one of the things I brought was one of my ostrich ferns, and I have, I, I got three or four of these from a, a, another master gardener, and now I have hundreds of them. I, I kind of brought this one because if you can look down here in the little, this is this is an ostrich fern, or it's also called a fiddlehead. Okay. And you have to, if you're going to like forage these fiddleheads, because that they are edible, you have to make sure the type of, of fern you have, you there. Some of them are somewhat toxic. So just don't go out and if you don't see eat it a you know. fiddlehead and think that it, that it's okay to eat unless you know specifically that it is an ostrich. But th th this will get to be another two feet tall. They're just huge. And this year has been a wonderful year for, you know, for this to, this to be beautiful. this big already is, is, is really nice. Awesome. Okay. That's it, guys. The show is over. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you guys for coming in and sharing your expertise with us. If you've got questions, send them to yourgarden at gmail.com or you can find us on Facebook. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Good night.